It was a stone of unprecedented value. The Romans mastered it and their emperors boasted with it. Later artists would marvel at it while their medieval rulers coveted it. It was the color of royalty, the stone of wealth, power, and prestige. It was imperial porphyry, the stone of an empire. Porphyry is a type of igneous rock consisting of two types of mineral crystals, a fine-grained silicate matrix in which are embedded larger grain crystals of feldspar or other minerals. The name is from the Greek word for purple, but it comes in a variety of colors. The deep purple type was known as imperial porphyry. The earliest mention of imperial porphyry comes from Pliny the Elder, who mentioned it in Book 36 of his Natural History. Porphyrites, which is another production of Egypt, is of a red color. The kind that is mottled with white blotches is known as leptocephos. The quarries there are able to furnish blocks of any dimensions, however large. Petracius Polio, who was steward in Egypt for the Emperor Claudius, brought to Rome from Egypt some statues made of the stone, a novelty which was not very highly approved of, as no one has since followed his example. While sculpture of porphyry did not seem popular in Pliny's time, that would change. Porphyry is quite common, with one exception. Unlike other forms of the stone, the deep purple type, known as imperial porphyry, was exceptionally rare. So rare, in fact, that only one source of imperial porphyry is known to exist. In the year 18 CE, a Roman named Caius Cominius Leugus discovered a deposit of deep purple porphyry in the eastern desert of Egypt. The site came to be known as Mons Porphyritus, the Porphyry Mountain. Known today by the name Jabal Abu Dukan, Mons Porphyritus was one of four Roman quarries in the region. The Romans established a central administrative complex in the valley today called Wadi Abu Ma'amal. The complex was complete with a fort, a bath, a temple to Isis Magiste and another to Serapis, a well, and a cistern. In the valley outside the central complex were five villages, three smaller forts at Badia, Belia, and Umsidri, temples to Miriam Nima and Pan, and forges. Mons Porphyritus was reached by a road called the Via Porphyritus, the Porphyry Road, leading west to Cana on the Nile River and east to the Roman fort at Abu Sha'ar on the coast of the Red Sea. Along the road, the Romans established a series of towers and hydromata, or watering wells. According to stelae found at Mons Porphyritus, the quarried stone was lowered to the valley below on ramps where it was roughly shaped, then loaded onto ox-drawn carts to be transferred onto barges bound for its eventual destination. The trip west to the Nile covered 150 miles with seven hydromata and hitching stones set up a day's travel apart. For over 400 years, the Romans would quarry imperial porphyry from Mons Porphyritus. Imperial porphyry was used in architecture, sculpture, and a variety of other decorative forms. The revetments of the Pantheon are made from panels of imperial porphyry, as are the huge discs inlaid in its great domed floor. Purple, which had long been associated with the senatorial class, took on a greater use with the imperial family, and porphyry became the stone that symbolized them. The imperial administration was the only entity which had the power and organizational ability to carry out the logistics of quarrying, transportation, and utilization of this rare stone from the distant reaches of the empire. But it was with the Eastern Romans of the Byzantine Empire that porphyry reached its greatest use. Emperor Constantine erected a massive column at the center of his forum in Constantinople, comprised of at least seven massive drums of porphyry and measuring over 30 meters in height. The Emperor Justinian used eight columns of imperial porphyry, each carved from a single piece of the stone, to support the exedrae of the Hagia Sophia. Byzantine emperors were crowned while standing on the Amphalion, the navel of the earth which was a floor panel inlaid with numerous types of porphyry, including imperial porphyry. Byzantine empresses gave birth to the royal children in a room of the great palace of Constantinople, completely tiled with imperial porphyry, leading to the term porphyrogenitos, quite literally, born in the purple. In the late 3rd century, the stone became popular with the wealthy for funerary purposes, specifically for the creation of sarcophagi. The stone's first use in a funerary context is mentioned by Suetonius, who wrote that part of the Emperor Nero's funeral altar was made from it, but it was the Emperor Diocletian who had the first sarcophagus made from imperial porphyry. Porphyry sarcophagi became common with Roman imperial families. 
The two best examples of this are the sarcophagi of the emperor Constantine's mother Helena and his daughter Constantia, both of which are found today in the Vatican Museums. Their exquisite workmanship and deep relief attest to the artistry and skill of Roman sculptors, but also to another important thing, Roman technology. Porphyry is amongst the hardest of stones, measuring a seven on the Moore scale of mineral hardness, approximately equivalent to steel. Roman metal smithing was extremely advanced, and the Romans could produce high-quality steel strong enough to sculpt the equally hard porphyry. This resulted in later cultures themselves lacking such capabilities to look upon the exquisite work of Roman stone carving with awe. Further, the association of the purple imperial porphyry and the Roman imperial family found expression with the medieval kings and emperors of Europe. Lacking access to new stone or the ability to match the craftsmanship of the ancient Roman stone carvers, medieval architects recycled Roman porphyry in several ways. Broken pieces of Roman porphyry were reworked into new pieces or even recycled as is into other structures and art. Most notably, a number of medieval royalty were buried in Roman porphyry sarcophagi, while others had sarcophagi recycled from other Roman structures such as columns. The decline of the Roman Empire also meant the decline of the extensive bureaucracy necessary to operate the vast Roman economic machine, including the quarries in Egypt. Mons Porphyritus ceased production sometime in the 5th century. All chance for further import ended after Egypt was lost to the Byzantine Empire less than a century later. For nearly 1400 years, the source of imperial porphyry remained hidden from history until the location of Mons Porphyritus was rediscovered by British Egyptologist Sir John Wilkinson in 1823. The quarry is silent now. There are no workers hewing the stone from the mountain. No one lowers it down to be loaded upon ox carts bound for the Nile. Stone-laden barges no longer float down the river to boats bound to deliver the material to emperors afar. Imperial porphyry, like the ancient Romans that employed it, no longer commands the power that it once did. And yet, through the works that the Romans of the West and East fashioned from it, imperial porphyry lives on as the stone of an empire. Thank you.